We can grab our seats, grab our seats and open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 15. <clears throat> Actually, we're going to back up just a couple verses. We're going to back up just a couple verses. We're going to back up to verse 34 of chapter 14. And we're going to read down through verse 20 of chapter 15. So it says, When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent out into all the surrounding region, brought to him all who were sick, and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched it were made perfectly well. Then the scribes and the Pharisees, who were from Jerusalem, came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the uh, the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. So he answered them, said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and... He who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a man. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you not know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So, Lord, would you just honor the reading of your word? Would you go before us, Lord, and would you speak to us? Lord, would you give us open hearts to receive what you have for us this morning? We thank you. We praise you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, last week we saw... A couple miracles by Jesus, right? We saw the feeding of the 5,000, as we call it. You know, and as we studied it last week, we realized that when they they number 5,000, they're really only numbering the men in the group. So it was more likely uh, 15,000, probably, that were being fed, right? We see Jesus there walking on the water, right? We see Peter bold enough to step out of the boat, Right? Peter says, if, if that's you, Lord, command me to come out to you. Right? And we see Jesus stepping out on the water, and we see Peter stepping out of the boat and going to him. Right? These two amazing stories, these stories of faith, right? where, where Jesus does something amazing, but yet he chooses to involve people. Right? Remember the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus told his disciples, you feed them. Right? Jesus gave them an impossible task. You know, these two stories answer a couple questions for us, right? The first question would be, what do I do 
with what I have? What do I do with what I have? Right? Because what I have, as we saw last week, is meager at best. Right? Jesus says, you feed them. You give them something to eat. You know, and, and we know that Andrew shows up with a little boy's lunch and says, Lord, all we have are these two fish and these five barley loaves. And it was barely enough food for the little boy, let alone 15,000 people. Yet in the hands of Jesus, right, it says that everyone was filled. That word in the Greek is gorged, right? They couldn't fit any more food if they wanted to. And then they pulled up 12 baskets After, everyone was fed, right? What do we do with what we have? We give it to Jesus, because in the hands of Jesus, that's where change happens. That's where miracles are produced. Not in us, in the hands of Jesus. Another question I think that that gets answered for us in last week's study was, what do we do when the storm comes? Or more importantly, who are we looking to when the storm comes? Because the storm is inevitable, right? The storm is going to come. And the amazing thing about that story is that we see Peter, right, our favorite disciple, stepping out of the boat, taking a step of faith, saying, Lord, command me to come to you. What do we do when the storm comes? We fix our eyes on Jesus. Right? We saw this last week. We fix our eyes on him. He's who we look to in life's struggles. And so this morning, we're going to be focusing on a group of people that they choose to fix their eyes on Jesus, but for a different reason, for a different purpose, not in faith. And the reason I wanted to go back and read the last couple of verses of chapter 14 is because I see a very powerful contrast between two groups of people, right? Because after Jesus feeds the multitude, right, after Jesus commands his disciples, right, to get in the boat, right, to, to cross the Sea of Galilee, right, and there's Jesus walking on the water, right? It says that they, they thought they saw a ghost, And Peter's like, Lord, if that's you, command me to come out to you. John's gospel tells us that after Jesus got into the boat, that they were immediately on the shore, right? The storm was gone, and they were at the shore there in the area of Gennesaret. And here's the amazing thing. When they get to the land of Gennesaret, the people there knew that Jesus had arrived. And they knew that all we have to do is get to Jesus, If we can just touch his clothes, all we need to do is touch the hem of his garment and people will be healed, right? Mark's gospel tells us they were carrying people on beds to Jesus just to touch his clothing. You see, they knew that there was something about Jesus, that they knew that if we can just get to him, our deepest need, our hardest struggle doesn't matter what life is throwing at us. We just need to get to Jesus. We just need him. This first group, these folks there in in Gennesaret, they experience Jesus' power. And their lives are changed. But in chapter 15, we see another group of people. We see the second group, and they don't experience the power of Jesus, and their lives are not changed. You have a group that responds to Jesus and say, if we can just get to him, if we can just touch his clothes, we can be healed. He can meet our deepest need if we can just get to him. And you have this other group, these scribes and these Pharisees, They've traveled up from Jerusalem for the purpose of seeing Jesus. And of all the things that Jesus has done this far in his ministry, I mean, he just, he just fed the multitudes with two small fish and a couple barley loaves, right? A meager lunch. Thousands of people fed. He was just walking on the water. 
he commanded Peter to come out to him. And Peter walks on the water. Forever how brief it may have been, he was walking on the water. Peter means stone. If anything was going to sink, it would have been a stone. But he didn't sink until he took his eyes off of Jesus. And here were these scribes and these Pharisees coming from Jerusalem to meet with Jesus. To say, hey, what's up with the hand washing? How come you guys don't do it? That's the question that they want to ask. Jesus, why don't you wash your hands? I mean, I don't know about you, but if I had the opportunity to stand before Jesus, that is not the question I would have asked. Especially in light of what he had just done. I mean, even if my questions could be foolish in nature, it's still, like, Jesus, did your feet get wet when you were walking on the water? Did it... Did it splash when you walked, or were you kind of hovering? Like, hey, why don't you guys wash your hands? That's their question. They've traveled from Jerusalem to the area of Galilee. It's a 75-mile walk to say, hey, why don't you guys wash your hands? Would you see the contrast here of how they've missed it? How they've missed it. Who Jesus is, what he's capable of. And they can't think past their traditions, their rituals. They say it. This isn't a commandment by God. This is their tradition. The tradition of the elders. Newsflash, you can't transgress a tradition of the elders. You transgress the commandments of God. But they're asking the question, why do your disciples transgress the traditions of our elders by not washing their hands before they eat bread? Jesus just fed the multitudes and they're more concerned with the fact that they didn't wash their hands beforehand. Listen, forget the hand washing. The first group gets it. The first group understands, right? They realize that when you have a desperate need, when you know someone who has a desperate need, if you can just pick up their bed and if you can carry them to Jesus, he can fix it. He can make it right. He can heal them. They understand that there is somewhere to go. There is someone who can meet my deepest need. Where is your point of desperation this morning? What is your struggle? What is it that you need in your life? What are you struggling with? And are you bringing it to Jesus? Have you brought it to Jesus this morning? Are you trying to reach the hem of his garment? If I can just get to his clothes, his clothes would be close enough. Or are you too busy pointing your finger at someone that's not washing their hands? That's how this group of these scribes and Pharisees, that's how they've missed it. Instead of focusing on Jesus and what he can do in their lives, they're pointing the finger. Psalm 40 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined to me. He heard my cry and he also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock and he established my steps. He's put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear, and I will trust in the Lord. Jesus wants to take us out of the miry clay, out of the pit, and he wants to place us on the rock. So as we move into chapter 15, as we move into what these scribes and these Pharisees have missed, how they're 
holding to their traditions. We might say legalism. Right? Their traditions are being held above the word of God. And so there's six things that we want to consider in terms of their traditions. Six things. The first of which is the question, right? As we've already kind of hinted at. The question by these religious leaders. Look at verses 1 and 2. The scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? Why do they not wash their hands when they eat bread? These religious leaders, these scribes and Pharisees, you know, the scribes, the scribes were copyists. They were copyists. Their job was to take the law and to transcribe it, to copy it. These guys knew scripture. They spent all their time copying it from one parchment to another. And I don't know about you, but that is how I learn best. I personally can't just sit in a room and listen to somebody. My mind's going to drift off somewhere. I'm going to come back five minutes later going, what, just, what did they say? I missed it. I have to transcribe it to paper. I have to take it from the board and write it down. That's how I learn. That's how I remember things. These guys, that's what they did all day long. They knew the scripture. In fact, in other parts of scripture, they're called lawyers. Because they were the ones that were called on to interpret the more difficult passages of scripture. Because they knew it so well. The Pharisees... The Pharisees were what we might call the extreme religious right. They were the ones who upheld and enforced the adherence of the law. Right? These guys knew the law too, but they also went around to make sure that you were also following. You were adhering to what the law says. And as we're going to see here in a few minutes, also by extension, that you are adhering to their traditions, how they interpret God's law. Both of these groups, these scribes and these Pharisees, they are steeped in tradition. They can't get out of it. They can't do something different. This is the way it has always been. We've always washed our hands that way. Why would we do it differently now? Notice that they're from Jerusalem. They're from the epicenter, right? They may even be part of the Sanhedrin, the the, the leadership of the scribes and the Pharisees, right? If anybody knew the law, if anybody knew their traditions, it was them from Jerusalem. And they've traveled 75 miles, probably a three-day walk. Can you imagine traveling three days to get to Jesus? Like, hey, man. How come you guys don't wash your hands? But if you remember, you know, a couple weeks ago when Jesus went into the, to the synagogue and he healed the man with the withered hand, right? And that they were there and they were watching to see what Jesus would do, right? And it said there in, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 14, that when the Pharisees, then they went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. You see, that's their agenda, It's not really about hand washing. They were just looking for an excuse. They were looking for an accusation to throw at Jesus. And the best they could come up with was, you guys aren't washing your hands. You see, these scribes and the Pharisees, they're not concerned with hygiene. That's not their concern here. Right? We we wash our hands before a meal because we know it's good practice, right? Right? But that's not what they're concerned with. No, this is about their traditions, their rituals, their ceremonial hand washing. See, it wasn't just you go to a little soap dispenser and running under some running water, okay, we're good. No, this is a very specific, right? They had to hold their hands up so the water ran down off their elbow, right? Then they would reverse it so it ran down their fingertips, and then they would 
put their wrists up so it would run off their wrists. It was a very specific way to wash their hands so that they could be holy, so that they could be righteous. The belief was that their dirty hands might defile them. Right? The idea was if their hands are defiled and they pick up that piece of bread and they then eat the bread, then they themselves become defiled. They become polluted. They become unrighteous because they've eaten with hands that haven't been washed ceremonially. They might become unholy. You see, they saw themselves as holy because they followed the law to a T. Right? They crossed every T, they dotted every I, they did it just right, the way their elders have told them to, so that they can be holy. Yeah, but what's interesting is this isn't command- a commandment by God. Right? Verse 2 tells us that, it's, that they have transgressed the traditions of the elders. This is simply a, trans, a, a tradition that has been passed down from generation to generation, stemming all the way back to their captivity in Babylon. They've been doing this since their captivity in Babylon. And we're not going to get into it this morning, but they have all kinds of weird superstitions as to why right, they believe that while they slept that, that demons would rest on their hands. So when they had to get up, they had to wash their hands a certain way to get the demon off. This is not about hygiene. This is about tradition. But do we have anything like this in our own lives? We may not have specific ritualistic ways to wash our hands, but we all have traditions, right? In particular around Christmas or Thanksgiving, right? We have things that we do Right, that are family traditions that have been passed down from generation to generation. You know, and sometimes when those traditions have to change, right, because families change, right? Generations get older and, and you know, the, the younger folks start having kids and those things have to kind of change. And some people don't like it when that apple card gets upset, right? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with our Christmas traditions. I'm not saying that. What I am saying, though, is where is our focus? Do we allow these things to upset us? You see, what I'm trying to challenge here is how tight of a grip do we hold on to something that's not the Word of God? Okay, you following with me? How tight of a grip do we hold on to something it's not scripture. It's not his word. Because I would encourage you this morning to hold a very tight grip on God's word and a very loose grip on anything that's not. Here's the challenge. Nothing in this world, whether physical, whether emotional, whether traditional, Nothing should keep us from Jesus. And nothing should keep us from what he is wanting to do in our lives. These scribes and these Pharisees have missed it. And so I like how Jesus responds. The second thing we want to look at, the second thing we want to consider in terms of tradition is not just the question that the scribes and the Pharisees asked. But the question that Jesus asks the scribes and the Pharisees, the question that Jesus has for the religious leaders. You see, Jesus responds in very Jewish fashion. He answers their question with another question. All right, look at verse 3. He says that he answered and he says to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition. For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. 
then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Notice how Jesus challenges them this morning. He challenges these scribes and these Pharisees by asking them, why why is your man-made tradition more important than God's commandment? And what he does here is he takes us back to Exodus chapter 20. He takes us back to the Ten Commandments, specifically the Fifth Commandment, right? In Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, right, the Fifth Commandment is to honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. In fact, Paul, when he quotes this, says that this is the first commandment with promise, It's the first commandment with promise. If you honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. Honor your father and mother. Children, this morning, are you taking notes? Memory verse for today. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long upon the land. And then he also quotes from Exodus 21. Verse 17, and he who curses his father and mother shall surely be put to death. How's that for a memory verse? You see, you have to remember, there wasn't always social security to lean on, right? There wasn't always a 401k in the bank account for when we retire. That was not how it worked in the ancient world. Now, how it worked was your father and mother cares for you. They raise you. They provide for you. And when the time comes, you return that favor, and you care for them, and you provide for them. That was the retirement plan. That was how it worked. That's how it should work. It's how it's commanded in God's word, that we should be willing as children to care for and provide for our parents when they need us, when the time comes. God's word is clear. We are to honor our father and our mother. It says if we curse our parents, the penalty is death. You see, the idea of a curse, the the idea of a curse here is more like what we would think of as a death threat. Okay, so when it says if we curse... If we threaten the lives of our parents. That's what it's referring to here. Since to curse was to will and to pray the downfall of another with all of one's heart. It represented the attitude from which sprang acts like striking murder. That's what it's talking about. So here's here's what Jesus is pointing out. Here's what Jesus is trying to get across. Because hand washing wasn't the only tradition that they had. There was more than 18 ways to wash your hands. And each one of those 18 had subsets on how it was to be done. But that's not the only tradition that they have. That's not the only thing that they obsessed over. No, they had another tradition too. And Jesus is calling them out on it. Here's what he's pointing out to us, right? Is that our parents, as they get older, it's our responsibility, right, as their children to care for them, to provide for them when necessary, right? That is the appropriate, that is the responsible response, right, to care for our parents. After all, right, they raised us, they provided for us, they gave us the life that we have. You know, when I think of my parents, I wouldn't have the faith I have if it weren't for my mom. Her faith, her example in my life. I wouldn't have the work ethic and the drive to provide for my family had it not been my father's example in my life.
So when they need me, I want to be there for them. But there was a problem. And in Mark's gospel, in this, the same account, it's called Corbin. It's called Corbin. Mark 7, 11 says, But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corbin. This is a gift from God. Corbin means a gift to God or dedicated to God. In other words, if you give something to God, if it's dedicated to God, it becomes untouchable for anyone else. No one else can touch it. And, and I mean, this by itself is fine, right? There's nothing wrong with dedicating something to the Lord, right? There's nothing wrong with saying, okay, this is mine, but God, when you have need of it, it's yours. You can have it. There's nothing wrong with that. Unfortunately, though, that's not really what's happening. You see, the tradition that they had created was unfortunately far worse. When, when they said something was Corbin, when they said something was dedicated to the Lord, the traditions of their elders had told them that when your parents have need, they can't touch it because it's been given to God. Picture this. I mean, just picture it for a moment, right? Your brother calls you up. Hey, mom and dad ain't doing so good. They really need help. In fact, they're, they're on their way to your house right now. And you're like, oh, Corbin, 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 dedicated, dedicated, dedicated. It's a gift to God. Right, mom and dad show up. Hey, how you doing? Sorry, it's, it's all been given to God. I can't, I can't help you. Do you see what's going on? They were so selfish, wanting to keep things for themselves. If I dedicate it to God, nobody else can touch it. And Jesus is saying, he's calling them out. Why do you transgress the commandment of God over your traditions? This was a tradition of the elders to call something Corbin, to say it was dedicated to God so you didn't have to give it up. You didn't have to part with it. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's what Paul says. If anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his household, he's worse than an unbeliever, has denied the faith. The truth is, is that everything we have belongs to the Lord. You know, maybe we don't have a problem caring for our parents. Maybe that's not a struggle that we have. It was certainly a struggle that they had, right? And Jesus calls them out on it. The bigger question here is what are you holding back? What are you trying to keep for yourself? What do you have you have such a tight grip on that you refuse to let go? You're saying, God, you can have everything, but you can't have this. This is mine. Can't touch it. And I think if we're being honest with ourselves, we all have that something. Right? Our knuckles are getting white because I just don't want to let this go. I can't loosen the grip on this. What, <clears throat> excuse me, what is it that we are telling God that he can't have? C.T. Sud said, if Jesus Christ be God and that he died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. If Jesus Christ be God and if he died for me, no sacrifice is too great 
for me to give to him. You see, we should be willing to say, Jesus, it's all yours. Use it how you see fit. This is the hypocrisy that they had, and he calls them out on it. Right? The third thing we want to see is the hypocrisy of their tradition. In verse 7, he says, hypocrites. He calls them out. And he quotes from Isaiah. He says, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. He says, in vain they worship me, teaching the doctrines of the commandments of men. They are more focused on their man-made traditions, their man-made commandments, than they are of God's word. And Jesus says, you guys are hypocrites. Your hearts couldn't be farther from me. Man, me, Jesus never say that about me. See, the problem is simple. They knew all about God. That was what they did. They studied his word. They transcribed it. They spent all their time making sure others knew what God's word said. But their hearts, their hearts were far from him. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at the appearance or at his physical stature, Because I have refused him, for the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. These scribes and these Pharisees, they're living in legalism. They're living in their traditions and their rituals. And their heart is far from the Lord. Do you see how they missed it? That's why they're sitting there focused on hand washing and not on the fact that the Messiah has come and is meeting the deepest needs of people's lives. See, it's not about legalism. Legalism is solving the wrong problem. It's about Christ. Our focus should be on him. Well, we have to hurry. The fourth thing, it's not just their hypocrisy, but then Jesus makes a statement to the multitudes. Right? He calls upon the multitudes and he makes a statement. In verse 10, he says, When he called the multitudes to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a man. It's not what goes in. It's what comes out. Defiles. It means to pollute. It means to be unclean, unholy. And Jesus here infers two things. He infers two things. He infers food and he infers the heart. Right? Food. Food is what goes in the mouth. Right? We eat food. I'm already thinking about food. Right? It's almost lunchtime. God had very strict dietary laws for them. Right? We call it kosher or non-kosher. So the thinking here for them was if they put the wrong thing in their mouth, right? And when we talk about men's breakfast and we, we talk about having bacon, right, for men's breakfast. They couldn't eat bacon. That was unclean. That was not kosher. I, mean, I don't know about you, but can you imagine a life without bacon? But they were afraid if they eat something that was on the do not eat list, they would become unholy, unrighteous, unclean if they didn't eat it in a way that was prescribed by the tradition of their elders, they would become unclean, unholy, unrighteous. But Jesus is, of course, dealing with the heart. He's not dealing with food. 
He's dealing with the heart. Right? He's saying that what you eat isn't going to defile you. It's not going to make you unholy. It's not going to make you unrighteous. I mean, okay, yes. Physically, maybe. Right? If all you eat is bacon, that might be a problem. You might get sick. But it's not going to make you unholy. It's not going to make you unrighteous. Romans 14, 14, Paul says, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him considers anything to be unclean. To him, it is unclean. He says in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 and 13, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach, and the stomach is for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. The stomach has its purpose, right? Food has its purpose in our lives. But what Jesus is talking about is the heart. He wants our heart. Heart, that's what comes out. Food goes in, but the display of our heart is what comes out of our mouth. That's what Jesus is saying. This is what shows our defilement. The problem is not the external, it's the internal. It's what's inside. Where's the problem? It's where it's always been. It's in our heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things. It is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Isaiah, in, in chapter 64, verse 6 says, But when we, we are like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness, all of our righteousness are like filthy rags. That's what we have to offer, filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Matthew 12 says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. He says, brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the treasure, out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you, that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account. They will give an account for it one day in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. You ever you ever say something and instantly want those words back? It's like as they're coming out, you're like, oh, get them back in there. Right? And you're having to go and apologize. I'm so sorry I said that. Liar. That came out of your heart. That was already there. Your mouth just exposed you. Right? It was already there. Here's the point. It's a simple one. Unwashed hands might make you unhealthy physically. Right? Unwashed hands might make you sick. Right? What goes into the mouth it could poison us. It could give us cancer. But the condition of our hearts, that is what Jesus is dealing with. That is what defiles us. So Jesus tells them this parable in verse 12. It says, Then his disciples came and they said to him, Do did, did you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Jesus is talking about these scribes and these Pharisees, and 
He says, they haven't been planted by God. Right? He says, do you not know? Right? So the disciples are like, hey, you, you, know, you just offended those guys. They came all the way here from Jerusalem. They traveled three days, and you just offended them. And Jesus is like, yeah, uh, my heavenly father didn't plant them. They're blind leaders of the blind. They're going to follow into a ditch, and anyone else that follows them is blind as well and will also end up in the ditch. And we have to be careful we don't end up as blind as they are. And again, the point is simple, but yet powerful. They are being led by the traditions of men and not by the word of God. What is it that guides you? What is it that makes your decisions? When you choose to do something, how are you being guided? Are you doing something because that's the way you've always done it and there is no other way to do it? Or are you being led by the word of God? Is his word instructing you, guiding you, directing you, right? The psalmist says that it's a light unto our path. His word lights the way and the way we should go. The word of God needs to be the barometer in which we gauge everything. Everything. Any decision we make should be made in light of Scripture. Listen, don't believe anything anyone tells you, especially me. Don't believe me just because I'm up here. No, test it. Test it against the Word of God. You need to be like the Bereans, right, of Acts chapter 17. Right, verse 11 says that these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness. They're, they're receiving the word. They're hearing God's word. But they searched the scriptures to see if these things were so. Listen, don't just take my word for it. Don't just take someone else's word for it. Test it against what's in this book. This is what should be directing and instructing our lives. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, to test all things and to hold fast to what is good. John 17.17 says, sanctify them by your truth, that your word is truth. See, these scribes and the Pharisees, they knew the word, I met a guy when I was in high school. Our, our high school uh, senior class always took a New York City trip. And, and I met this guy on the, the streets of, of New York City that had the Bible memorized. The whole thing, cover to cover. Right? As I was talking with him, he told me, like, if you, if you hand me a Bible and you drive a nail through that Bible, I will tell you every word it's going to hit on the way through. But he didn't believe a word of it. He just had an identic memory, and he sat down one day, he read it, and memorized it. Because he was bored, had nothing else better to do. This guy also sat down one day and memorized the Manhattan phone book. Just for something to do. The scribes and the Pharisees. The, The Pharisees memorized the Torah. The first five books of Moses, they had them memorized. But it's not in their hearts. Right? We have to be in this book and we have to let it impact our hearts. Because our hearts is what exposes us. So the last thing we want to look at as we bring this to a close is, is our, favorite, our favorite disciple, Peter. Right? Peter steps up and he asks Jesus to explain this parable. Right? Peter answered and says to him, explain this parable to us. And so Jesus says, are you still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. 
For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Peter, seeking to understand, says, Jesus, explain it to me. I need help. I don't quite get it. Remember, Peter, Peter was the only one willing to get out of the boat. Right? There are the disciples. Right? The storm has hit, and they're like, I think that's Jesus out there. But Peter's the one that says, Lord, command me to come out. Right? Peter's the one with enough boldness to say, Jesus, I don't quite get it. Can you explain it to me? And I don't want to read too much into the text, but I can imagine some of those disciples sitting there going, I don't know, what is he talking about? I don't get it. But Peter's like, Lord, tell me. I want to know. I want to understand. We need to be like Peter. Right? And when we come to God's word and we, we're seeking him in his word, say, Lord, reveal it to me. Show me your word. Show it to me. I want to understand. Jesus' explanation is simple, right? Whatever we put into our bodies, right? Whatever we put into our bodies will be eliminated, he says. It goes into the stomach and is eliminated, right? God has given us a digestive system. He's given us an immune system to deal with these things. I mean, let's, let's face for For those of you that, that know me, Right, I'm, I'm a mechanic, right? That's my trade. I work on cars. And I'll be honest with you. There are days when I'm at work and it's too busy. My hands are dirty, but I'm going to grab that sub and I'm going to eat it anyway. And I'm going to trust and hope that as I prayed over that food and asked the Lord to bless it, that he's going to allow my body to do what it's supposed to do and eliminate those things that I perhaps just ingested. The problem is that the scribes and these Pharisees, they're focusing on the external and they're ignoring the inward man. The fact is less about the action. It's less about the action itself. It's more about the attitude of our hearts, right? In fact, if, the, if our heart, if our attitude is right, the correct action should follow, but if we put the action first, we miss it, right? It just becomes lip service, as Jesus says, right? As, as he quotes Isaiah, right? They're, they're, they say the right thing. They do the right thing, but their heart couldn't be farther from me. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I've become a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have faith, so that I can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Listen, Jesus is not saying traditions are bad. Jesus is not saying that that just because we do something and we do it this way every time does not mean it's bad. What he's saying is that it's about the heart. Here's the rub. We need a new heart. Because the one we have is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Anything I can produce is filthy rags. My righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. And I'm sorry, but your righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. Your heart is deceitfully wicked. It is. And here's the rub. A new heart is not something that we can get ourselves. Can't do it. Psalm 51.10 Creating me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Ezekiel thirty six twenty six, 
I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take your heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The problem is our heart. And the bigger problem is there's nothing we can do about it. Only God can do that. He's the only one that can clean our hearts. He's the only one that can take our hard, stony hearts and soften it. Make it pliable to receive him. This clean heart, this steadfast spirit, this heart of flesh it does not come through tradition. It does not come through rituals. It does not come through hand washing. It only comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is it. Narrow is the way that leads to life. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. It is only Jesus. Where are you this morning? What are you going through? Are you just going through the motions? Are you just following because that's what everyone before you has always done? This is just the tradition. This is the way we do it. It's the way we've always done it. Are you too busy pointing your finger at someone not washing their hands correctly? Listen, God wants to give you a new heart this morning. He wants to do that. He wants to clean our hearts. He wants to remove that heart of stone and give us that heart of flesh. You know, we're going we're gonna to come to the table in just a minute. You know, I was hoping we could do this song. We couldn't, couldn't quite make it happen this morning. But Keith Green has a wonderful song. It comes right out of Psalm 51, right? Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. That is what God wants to do in our lives this morning. He wants to restore us. He wants to clean us. He wants to take our dirty, wretched heart. And he wants to clean it this morning. So as we come to the table, let's do business with the Lord. Let's let him clean it. Because it's only by the blood of Jesus that it can be cleansed. And so, Lord, we thank you. We praise you this morning for your word. Lord, we, we thank you for your truth. Lord, we thank you, God, that we don't have to keep this heart of stone. God, that we can come to you and we can receive a new heart, one that is soft and pliable, one that has been cleaned by the, by the blood of Jesus. God, we thank you. We praise you this morning for who you are, for what you have done, God. And I pray that we have not missed it this morning. I pray that we realize that this morning you can meet our deepest and darkest need. It doesn't matter how far we have traveled from you. It does not matter how deep a pit we have dug for ourselves. You can reach down and pull us up. Just as Peter he took his eyes off of you and he started to sink, but you were right there. The storm was raging around him and yet you reached down and you pulled him out of the water. God, for many of us this morning, we need you to reach down and you pull us up to take us out of the pit, the miry clay that we are in and restore us. Lord, would you create in us a clean heart this morning? Would you renew 
a right spirit within us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.